Hey, welcome back. Are you thinking about buying a telephoto lens? You know, there are so many telephoto lens in the market and the price starts from below $1,000 all the way to over $12,000. So what is really the secret of that huge price difference? Are these lens really $10,000 sharper or is it about f2.8, f4, f5.6 and 6.3? In this video, I'm going to share with you three critical factors before you decide. And by the end of this video, you should be able to make a much more informed decision on how to choose a suitable lens before you spend all this money. Hello everyone, Tin Man Lee here. So today we are gonna talk about the most arguable topic, choosing the lens. So this one is a Nikon 500PF f5.6. This is a 402.8. You all know that when you buy a lens, right? Some of you might have the Sony 200 to 600. And some of you have the Canon 100 to 500, right? For Canon, it is uh, the 100 to 500 f 4.5 to 7.1. The Sony 200 to 600 is f5.6 to 6.3. So you see these two numbers, right? They 4.5, 7.1. What does it really mean? So what it means is that uh, because those are zoom lens, right? So there are two range, right? One is the shorter uh, side, which is the 100 millimeter. And for the Canon is 500 on the long side. So that means at 100 millimeter, if you zoom to 100 millimeter, the largest aperture, which is the smallest F number you can go is uh, F4.5. And then at 500, uh, you can set it at F4.5 because of the technology or something. So the largest aperture you can set is 7.1. That 7.1 is very important to remember. So that is called maximum aperture of your lens. So for example, right now I have a 402.8. When I go out into the field, I can still shoot at f8, right? I can still shoot at f7.1 with this lens. However, that is not my maximum aperture. The maximum aperture of this lens is 2.8. So that means I can go down to 2.8 and it can still shoot. But for some of the lens, for example, like this um, 500 5.6, right? That is the PF lens. I can sh also shoot it at f7.1. I can shoot it at f8. The lowest I can go is f5.6, right? I can't go to f4. I can't go to f2.8. So that is is the terminology what we call the maximum aperture so that is very important for the topic we talk about today when we talk about what is the best lens people are gonna fight people are gonna yell at each other and then there will be haters and stuff so we are not gonna do that what we are gonna talk about is for different purpose for different time of the day for for all these different for example you can argue with uh, what is the best lens for landscape versus uh, bird photography for example and then if you go to Yellowstone uh, your favorite lens may be different from when you go to Kenya but I want to let you guys know a few fundamental guidelines of how you can decide what is is the best lenses right a lot of you have tell me that oh tin man i i can never afford something like this unless i sell my kidney or, uh, <laughs> or whatever so this is out of the question and then some of the people may tell me that ah this is just so heavy, right? I can never handhold this one. So I'm opting for like a 500 f5.6 and then all these things. And then all these reasons make sense. So let me share with you something, a story, of course. Imagine you just spend $8,000, 8,000 US dollars to book a tour to one of my favorite places, Kenya, okay? $8,000. And then you uh, you brought your favorite lenses and cameras. So you risk losing your luggage. You spend all your time doing the all the PCR tests. You have to go to Walgreens or whatever to take your passport photo so that it fits all the regulation to apply for the e-visa. All these hassles, right? I was there uh, about two years ago to Kenya. So we went out uh, after lunch to look for wild animals. Right? Everybody with me here, right? So very exciting. You got onto this land cruiser and then you just ride and then there's amazing playing and then like, beautiful animals and I still remember that evening we were just um, uh, trying to look for some big cats and all of a sudden we saw a jackal so over there we saw a den and there were quite a lot of uh, babies a lot of pups right so you know uh, so what we were doing is and then the, the angle was very good very good it's low angle so we basically can shoot and then the grass was not too long and so we decided to wait there for the sunset we can see the sun is slowly dropping starts from harsh lights to 
a little bit of this uh, golden light, saturated light, and then the light just when the sun is hitting the horizon, it just turned into a complete orange red, like reddish color is really beautiful. And then the the grass is catching on the backlit, and and we're still waiting because the pups, you know, they're skittish, they are in the den. At that moment, the pups finally came out, and they started to chase each other, they jump around, and then they were playing. And can you even imagine? And I was shooting so happily with my lens. I said, "Oh, this is awesome! This is awesome!" And after 15 minutes, the lights get got even better. And I said, oh, "Wow, this is amazing!" So I kept taking photos. And then I look around to other people in the vehicle and, and some of my friends on the other vehicle, and they were not shooting. And they were looking at me and as if like, "Can we go back to the camp?" And I and I was like. This is say like once a lifetime, like eye level with the jackal babies playing in the best golden light. And after another 10, 15 minutes, the lights finally get darker and I couldn't focus anymore. And then I just sit back and say, wow, that is an amazing day. I turn around, the, the other vehicle had already left. And I said, where are they? And I said, oh, they left like 10 minutes ago. And then I talked to the people in my vehicle. Why didn't you guys shoot? And then they said, well, we can't focus. Oh yeah, our camera stopped focusing like long, long ago. And they, the, the whole time you were shooting, our camera couldn't even lock focus and that dawned on me i was using a 402.8 lens at the time and all of them were using a zoom lens uh, that was quite surprising right because you know you see all these tests in uh, deep reveal you know these lenses the zoom lenses are getting all these gold awards silver award they compare side by side with a dollar bill they zoom in to compare with the prime lens and the zoom lens spectacular result but what i didn't realize is about that part about the the focusing in the capabilities so let me show you this this diagram right here so this is what a day looked like in the wilderness assume that it is not an overcast day you go out in pre-dawn and then the sky is still dark the sun hasn't come out so it's kind of purplish right and then slowly when the sun comes out then it started to get red and orange and then once the sun just come out you have like five to ten minutes of golden light and then the rest of the day is all this um, bright harsh light and then you go into the evening start again golden light and then reddish light and then this light and blah, 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 you go like that right um, all the zoom lens was able to focus no problem in those uh, crappy light but once the light gets better it also means the light also gets a little bit lower this is another diagram showing you what is my own conclusion about the maximum aperture right now is that when the lens um, has the maximum aperture of 2.8 it can focus no problem in those uh, really dark light in the bright light uh, all kinds of lenses were able to focus well, once the light is getting really dramatic and better the lens with maximum aperture that is a bigger number like 5.6 6.3 7.1 6 you couldn't even focus on that so let me ask you if you are spending thousands and thousands of dollars for a trip are you really going for the pictures in the crappy harsh light or you want to capture something that is more in the golden dramatic light with amazing action especially when in great action you need high shutter speed right and in high shutter speed the demand for the lens that is able to to capture those focus is even more more important right so at for a 2.8 lens uh, it has a much bigger opening meaning that more light is coming in uh, for for the camera to look for the focus right so more light is more more easy to focus yesterday i went to a uh, grocery store so i have to drive about 10 15 minutes once i drive out of the garage it's so bright and it's ah it is so bright right okay so what i do is i remove this one and then guess what i put on this one right so um so that's when i drive I drive and and I got to the um I got to the parking lot, and then uh, I was like okay uh, I gotta I gotta rush I gotta finish this grocery shopping quickly right so I I, I get off the vehicle and then I push the, like the the door is automatic actually the door opens of the grocery store and the grocery store was uh, really dark I went in and said I can't even see anything like like what happened like all this like these people everything is so dark and then I realized that I forgot to remove my sunglasses so I. I had to go out to back to my vehicle and take this off and then wear this one to see right so that is exactly the same idea with a f 5.6 6.1 f8 lenses you are like putting a, a sunglasses on the, the opening is so small it's very difficult for your camera to see any stuff
And this lens had absolutely no problem tracking the focus right on the eyes the whole time. I was shocked. I just want to share with you something about the weight. Nikon 600 f4 a few years ago used to be about 11 pounds. And then they have the second generation that came out that is about become 7 pounds. And right now, for example, this Sony 400 2.8 is about 6.6, 6.5 pounds. And then surprisingly, the, um, the Sony 200 to 500, 600 and the Nikon 200 to 500 is five pounds or something like that. So literally this lens is only like 1.5 to two pounds heavier, which I just did some Google search is about four to five medium sized bananas. <laughs> so weird for me to say that. And then you may say, okay, Tin Man, it is very expensive, right? This lens is what, freaking $12,000. I can buy two cars. Uh, is, is it actually indeed more expensive than my first used car that I bought? And um, so the lens, like these smaller zoom lenses is two, three thousand dollars or even $1,500, right? So what I want to share with you is let's not think about the cost of the lens for a moment, but think about the cost of not having the lens. So you spend thousands of dollars to go to a trip and then you realize that these zoom lenses give you a lot of trouble to focus on low light and on dramatic light and stuff. And so basically you're spending all this money and you bring something that is not suitable for those conditions and you come back with nothing. And versus you actually have the lens to be able to get the photos. And let me share with you. So I remember when I first bought my uh, 500 F4 Canon lens many years ago, it was brand new and I bought it for $5,000 at the time. I, I was using the lens for like six years. And then um, there's a new version that came out. So I decided to sell my old lens and buy a new one. And so what I learned is, okay, uh, in order to sell something, you have to first jack up the price a little bit so that you give room for people to negotiate. So for a new lens that is $5,000, I said, okay, I'm going to sell you the lens for $5,500. And then I just pause. And then uh, uh, the buyer said, okay, deal. And the reason is because during those five, six years, the Japanese yen actually rise up. So the new price of the lens became like $6,000. So 5500 is still a deal for her. But for me, I made $500 for using a $5,000 lens for six years. So if you think about that, these lenses, they preserve the value so well. And also the most important thing is that you have to think about the cost of not having a lens that allow you to express your art. You guys may know that I absolutely love Leonardo da Vinci and uh, I have his book. I have read it for many, many times and I've learned that there are many things in photography that we can learn from the oil painters and indeed a lot of my techniques actually derived from ideas of him and in his book and his in his manuscripts and his notebook um, there's one thing that he mentioned again and again which really helps to evoke the emotion and that thing is called a sfumato so sfumato means that when is is more like human psychology when a photo or a painting have this sfumato effect people tends to have more emotion to it their eyes would be drawn to the eyes of the animals much quicker and because it can be drawn to the eyes much quicker of the animal this connection started earlier and you have that feeling that the photo seems to be enchanting and magical for da vinci his painting like mona lisa and stuff the boundary is a little bit blurry when you do wide open on your lens with like a f 2.8 or f4 you also create this effect called the sfumato so you can see at f uh, 402.8, it just gives the, the boundary, the, the, the border of the lion and everything with this kind of oil painterly effect. And when I share the photo, no one complained that oh, the, the boundary, the main of the thing is not super sharp. Everybody were talking about what they feel when they look at this uh, lion. And that can only be achieved if you have like a 2.8 or f4 lenses and if you have 5.6 or 7.1 and those it is much more difficult to create this effect so that is uh, one thing that i'm still digging up uh, on to more information because i'm just obsessed with understanding what are the ingredients in a photo that evoke people's emotion because ultimately i think david dutchman right in his book uh, within, within the frame anybody read that book i think i highly recommend that one it's a really nice book he said nobody cares 
cares about another pretty beauty photos. The world doesn't need it. He said people only want to have a photo that moved them. That's why I started this journey since 10 years ago to find out what it takes to create photos that move people the most. In order to do that, first of all, you have to be able to create photos that has the highest image quality, the sharpness, the details, everything has to be top notch first. And then you go into other ingredients such as this fumato and a, a bunch of other things. If you enjoy this uh, video, click the like button, <laughs> uh, leave your comments and that will mean a lot to me and click on the subscribe button. And if you are serious about mastering your photography and save years of trial and error to learn how to nail the critical action consistently, definitely check out the guide below. Low.